Hello, everyone. My name is Jana Gordon. I am the Executive Director of Alumni and Development here at King's University College. And I'd really like to thank Dr. Aaron Hanna and Dr. John Grant for hosting tonight's Life After King session. Welcome, everyone. Although we are not presently on campus, I would like to start today by acknowledging that King's is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Lanapiwak, and Attawandaran peoples. This land continues to be home to diverse indigenous peoples whom we recognize as contemporary stewards of the land and vital contributors of our society. This event is run in partnership between the Alumni and Development Department and King's Political Science. Our goal is to give students an idea of the types of careers our alumni have and how they got here. So we hope that you will use this information wisely as you give some thought to your own life after Kings. And now I would like to introduce our guest speakers. First, we'll start with Colin Whitehead, class of 06. Colin graduated with honors degree in political science, and then he went on to complete a certificate in public relations, as well as a diploma in alternative dispute resolution from Western University's continuing studies program in 2007. Colin is a business development partner with Sun Life Financial and is also the president of the Abacus London chapter. He is also the current president of the King's University College Alumni Association. So welcome and thank you to Colin for being here tonight. Next, we have Monica Siriello. Monica has a passion for municipal politics and local government. She is currently the Director of Municipal Law and Licensing at the City of Hamilton, where she is responsible for developing regulatory policy and managing municipal policy reform, as well as overseeing enforcement of city bylaws and administrative tribunals. Monica previously practiced municipal and planning law in both the private and public sectors. In addition to her law degree in 2013 from the University of Detroit Mercy School of Law and her degree from King's in 2009, she obtained an MA in Political Science from the University of Windsor in 2010 and a Master of Public Policy from the University of Michigan in 2011. Monica is also a founding member of the Master of Public Policy and Digital Society program at McMaster University and is the Vice Chair of the License Appeal Tribunal and Tribunals Ontario and a monthly contributor to the Journal of Local Government Law. Thank you, Monica, for being here tonight. Next, we have Patrick Searle, class of 2011. Patrick Searle is the Director of Communications for the Council of Canadian Innovators. Previously, Patrick worked as Director of Communications for Ontario's Minister of Education. Additionally, Patrick has experience in the Office of Ontario's Minister of Transportation and the Office of Ontario's Minister of Training, Colleges and Universities, where he worked as Press Secretary and Senior Advisor of Digital Communications and Advisor of Legislative Affairs and Stakeholder Relations, respectively. Patrick obtained a Bachelor of Arts from King's where he focused on religious studies and political science. While he was on campus, Patrick volunteered as a King's Orientation soft leader and was elected as a member of the University Senate, president of the King's University College Students Council in 2009 and vice president of the University Students Council in 2011. Since 2020, Patrick has been a member of the Alumni Association Board at Western University and has acted as the USC Alumni Chapter President of Western University since 2018. Welcome, Patrick. And last but not least is Sean Blake, hailing from London this evening. And Sean is employed as an industrial cell specialist for ABB Electrification Canada, ULC. Sean is from the class of 2013 and has a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science and History. He was a varsity football athlete from 2009 to 2013. He completed a postgraduate and project management search certification 2018 project management professional, and is a current MBA candidate. His career aspirations include growing his leadership role within the electrical industry with the goal of making a significant impact on power and power distribution sustainability for the future. He enjoys golf, marathon, and Ironman endurance events as hobbies. Welcome, Sean. And thank you to all of you, all of you again for being here this evening. Now, we will 
begin our questions. Um, we will have question time and then, sorry, I will be asking the questions um, of our panelists. And then uh, we will wrap that up around 7.15. So if you have questions, please feel free to put them into the Q&A or to the chat. And around 7.15, we will grab those and, and answer them. And if we're not able to answer them online, we will get back to you with answers. Okay, everybody ready? Okay, let's see. I'm gonna go around um, my squares here. So I think we'll start with Patrick. Um, and the first question is, tell us about your time at King's. What did you study? Were you involved in extracurricular activities, which I think from what we just read you were, all of you were, and did you have a favorite professor? It's funny. Um, so thank you for having me tonight, uh, Dr. Canna, it's great to see you. Not front row like I used to sit in IR, but uh, very close. Um, you know, it's funny, my first year, I thought I was too good for Kings. And I hung out every day on main campus. And part of it was because I grew up in London. I went to a high school that fed right into Kings. So every day, and I was cool in high school, I was the prime minister of my high school. So I thought, you know, I, I was top. And then you go to Kings and you're just like, I see all these people, you know, I'm just gonna go hang out on main campus. And my whole plan was take the amazing entrance scholarships that Kings gives you and transfer into main campus in second year. That was my plan. And I kind of worked that plan by going home every night after school and not socializing. You know, seeing my friends on main campus and then really just going back. I worked at Masonville Mall and one day I was studying at this point, I was still in first year and I was taking English courses and Lorraine DeChico was teaching English. And Lorraine walks by me, you know, in that courtyard area between the library and Wemple and Labatt. And she says, hi, Patrick, I'll see you later. My heart stopped because not only did a professor know my name, but when I said that to all of my friends on King's uh, on main campus, they thought that was the most insane thing that could ever happen to them. They were terrified by that idea because they are part of 600 person classes. They sit far away from Dr. Hannah when they're in international relations. So I gotta say, it was that turning point that made me fall in love with King. So much so that I think somehow I ended up on the acceptance letters that were like issued, like there was my face, there's a photo somewhere. But what I was trying to, you know, figure out in my first year was what do I really want? And it was, you know, the best of these two worlds. I wanted that Western degree and that experience that was big and bold and, and everything that you didn't know was going to be thrown at you. But I also loved that community that Kings had. I loved our library. I loved the fact that we were one of the first to have, you know, 24 hour libraries across the whole campus. And at the time we were one of the latest libraries. So everyone that went home at 11 on main campus, we were still throwing in another hour. Um, I loved the fact that I could take courses that could adapt and change with my interests. So my favorite course that really sh shaped my trajectory uh, was uh, in third year. By this time I had been elected to be president of Kings and I took a course taught by Patrick Dunn. He was the former director of education for the, the Catholic school board in London. And it was called the politics of childhood education. And at this point, I, I thought I wanted to be a teacher. And it was that course that taught me about what goes on behind the chalkboard the politics behind our education and our public policy and how important it is for smart people to invest time into curriculum development, into policy development. And this world of public policy suddenly became much more interesting to me. And so it's what led me to go and work at the University Students Council. It's what helped me go from little kid government to big kid government and go work at Queens Park. But I really think it was also the fact that I was in a classroom of 35 other individuals with that proximity to a professor to help me through some of those questions that I was having in my third year that I know no one on main campus you know, gets access Access to. So I certainly, you know, enjoy and I thank uh, Professor Dunn um, for where I am today. But it was really the whole King's experience that I think led me to where I am today. Thank you very much, Patrick. Sean, we'll go to you. Tell us about your time at King's. 
Well, I, I coming out of, I guess I can start back in like coming out of high school, like I knew exactly what I was looking for, um, for, you know, an education post <laughs> post-secondary school. And uh, like, I was a football player through all my years at Western and, and after and in high school, I played football a long time. It's a big part of my life and it seems like a lifetime ago. But like I was fairly heavily recruited across Ontario, Quebec, Eastern Canada. And, you know, uh, I didn't want to move too far, but I wanted to be a, bi a big school. I wanted to have, a, a, I needed an education. I knew what I wanted from the education and I wanted to play ball as well. And Western provided like Kings campus, Kings from Western provided like, exactly what I needed. Like I struggled in the classroom, probably, you know, like it just didn't come naturally. It wasn't something that I, I've had, I've, I've developed greatly and probably started at Kings because high school, I grew up in Hamilton, high school was, was a breeze. It wasn't until you started getting into university where you really get pushed uh, as far as your academia. And the small classrooms, the attention from the professors, uh, the way the curriculum is built to support students, and then having main campus and all the resources that come from Maine was exactly what I was looking for. So for me, like I knew exactly what I was getting myself into. Um, and I, you know, I was put through through the dean's office. They had I had kind of an interesting experience coming into King's. Um, and my favorite professor, actually, he's he's not with us anymore, is um, Mr. Hugh Mellon, uh, Professor Mellon. And he was my favorite professor because he stood out in front of the classroom and he he wouldn't lecture as much as he would kind of just ask questions um, to prompt discussion. And in the space of you know political science, like there, that is you, you do need to learn how to to work with one of it's a soft skill. And, you know, he wouldn't sit there and tell you the answers or anything. He would sit there and he sometimes was just long pauses in classes. And for me at that time in my life, you know, I wasn't comfortable speaking in, in public, standing in front of a class of 100 students, 50 students was absolutely petrifying, which is hilarious given what I do for a living now. But it really started back then. So, you know, he was my favorite for professor. And, and actually, as I was just about graduating, I think he passed in 2015. Um, but he, I think he's, I, my first class with him was like a comparative politics course, I believe. And, uh, yeah, he was, he was hands down my favorite professor there. But yeah. And as far as extracurriculars, I played football for Western, which was an enormous time commitment during all my years, I think. So I spent a lot of time on both campuses. For sure. Thank you very much, Sean. Monica, we'll go to you. Tell us about your King's experience. Yeah, wonderful. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. I, I always love coming to these and, and sort of seeing the other alumni and, and where the career paths have taken everyone. It's so interesting for me, uh, just as it probably is for the students listening here today. So I have a similar experience. I'm going to say along Patrick, but I'll say I, I, res I, I recognize it perhaps a little bit sooner. Um, I'm also originally from London, and I come from a long line of Western grads. So my, my parents went there, my brothers went there. But I remember, despite being from London, I insisted on, on doing those tours of campus. I did the Western tour. I did the King's tour. I, I wanted that full experience. And what struck me about King's after touring was the intimate classroom experience. It was seeing that the teacher, the professors had a relationship with the students. You weren't just a number. And to me, that was something that I really wanted out of my, my education and out of my experience. And that was something that King's offered. Um, I, I wanted to be able to build those relationships in, in, in that network. And that's exactly what I got after my four years at King's. Really, my, my professors turned to mentors and they had such a profound impact on, on not only my further education, but, but my career, probably in, in more cases or, or more ways than they will have ever known. Um, I, I specialized in political science, so the majority of my courses were focused in, in this very department, but I took a range of them, and I, I have two professors that really stuck out to me, and, and one of them is, is no longer with us as well, Professor William McKercher. He taught foreign policy, which was super interesting at the time. It was the height of the Iraq War, Iraq War, and, and the War on Terror, and, and the seminars were just so... It, it, it was an inviting environment, despite being such a complex topic. And it was something that really taught me to get out of my comfort zone, 
to, to share my ideas, to share my thoughts and to give my, to, to build the confidence to, to be able to express what it is I was thinking on the topic. Um, my other, my other uh, professor that, that had such an impact was Carolyn Gibbs, Gibson. And she taught um, women in politics. And it actually inspired my master's thesis. I, I wrote a, a thesis on shattering the glass ceiling and why re women remain in second place following um, the Hillary Clinton first run in, in politics. And it ultimately was a factor. I, I actually threw my hat in and ran federally in the 2019 election. And I thought about her fondly and, and for the life of me, I can't find her. So if anyone knows where she is, I'd love to get in contact with her. But, but to this day, she still had such a profound impact on the way that I view politics and, and getting women involved and being able to make a difference in your community. Um, academics aside, I, I was involved in intramural sports. I, I really got involved in, in sort of the hockey and tennis and, and things like that. Um, I, I wasn't a part of, of student government, but it's something I wish I was a part of because I think in hindsight, I, I have more of an appreciation of how important it is to, to build your network and to build your relationships. And I think it's really easy to get, to get wrapped up in, in academia and academics. There's always a report you have to do or an exam you have to study for, but it's never too early to build your network at King's because you never know who you're gonna run into two years later. So I, I would say I, I would, I would be amiss to say that King's did not shape me into the person I am as well as set my trajectory in my career. So thank you. All right, thank you, Monica. And Colin, to you, tell us about your time at King's. Yes, thank you, Jana. And thank you everyone for uh, having me here uh, this evening uh, to have a conversation about this. This is uh, you know, a topic that's, uh, you know, or this, this, this theme is really important to me and, and to share for all of us to be able to share, uh, you know, our experiences is, uh, is critical as you all, get ready to graduate if you haven't graduated or you're getting ready to graduate to uh you know start down your career paths or whatever path uh, your life might take you on and uh you know i i think i'm listening to these other stories and i re it resonates so much i share so many of these experiences it's funny and you know uh, before i get into that though i'll say my high school i was not the prime minister of my high school uh i i i was i was somewhere in the middle and and, and you know the, the 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 fudge right i didn't really know what was what, what was going on i didn't really i was a late bloomer when it came to academia um i didn't actually start getting my marks up until uh grade 11 grade 12 halfway through grade 11 grade 12 um i wasn't really serious about uh about academics um until getting close to the end of high school and and uh, it was actually my father who said you need to go to university because i was just gonna go to to fanshaw to funshaw college uh take police foundations or something like that i didn't know i i didn't have a direction i needed a compass and and my father's like no you're going to university and i'm like why and he said well because there's going to be a lot of opportunities that are going to open up for you if you do go to university and i didn't know what he was talking about at the time but i'm like all right fine so I looked and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go apply for sociology, go go into sociology because that looks interesting. I don't know, I'll just grab that. And uh, so I when I came to King's, I actually was in sociology, and uh, I was like, okay, this is all right. I don't really know what I want to do uh, for a career once I graduate or anything like that. And then uh, I decided to take uh, poli sci twenty as one of my courses, and that's when I was introduced to a professor by the name of Jackie Newman. Now, Professor, professor Jackie Newman, I will say right off the bat, is by far my favorite professor uh, from my time at King's uh, for multiple reasons, but I do owe her a debt of gratitude uh, because she is the reason I ended up going into political science after my first year. Uh, it was her poli sci 20 course that inspired me and actually she was the first person to really you know, strike, a, you know, that, that light in, inside me, that flame inside me. And I, I found something I was actually passionate about. Um, I had no idea. Um, I didn't take any political science courses in high school. I didn't know anything about politics. I wasn't interested in politics in high school. Uh, and that changed very quickly uh, when, when I was in Professor Jackie Newman's course. Uh, Jackie Newman and then Hugh Mellon. So, you know, we, we talked about Hugh Mellon as well, uh, the late Hugh Mellon. Uh, he was another professor who greatly inspired me. And, and, and for similar reasons, uh, I was not very strong at public speaking. And, and I'm putting that uh, mildly here. Uh, it, it, 
but he had that way of really, you know, drawing that out of you and, and forcing you to talk, you know, sort of like his, his whole silent game he played. Um, you know, he just be quiet and force you to, to speak up. Uh, I have fond memories of Hugh Mellon playing poker with him actually in a hotel room in Ottawa during one of our political science association trips. Um, you know, Professor uh, Hugh Mellon and Jackie Newman. Uh, and I believe uh, Professor uh, Nesbitt Larkin's wife actually was in attendance. And, uh, and yeah, we had, uh, we had quite a lot of fun drinking a lot of wine uh, and then playing some poker. Um, so great fond memories of, of these professors for sure. Uh, Kings, Kings is interesting, you know, like main campus, I felt I took some courses at main campus and I, I always felt kind of lost when I had courses there. I didn't really have that personal touch with my professors and, and with Kings, you know, you really do have that relationship. If you want that relationship uh, with your professor, uh, you know, you really, you're on it. Like, you know, Monica said, you're on a first name basis with them. Um, and that really does, uh, you know, make all the difference and you build those networks. And, you know, I, I remember a few years ago, I was at, um, uh, this pub, English pub in London here, and I randomly ran into Professor Jackie Newman, and I was just like old times again, right? And and, and it's great, you know, you keep these connections, uh, you keep these connections for life. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I'll share for this question anyway. So I'll pass it back to you there. Okay, thank you, Colin, and thanks to all of you. Now we'll go on to the next question, and I'll start with Sean this time. Um, what do you do now? What led you to this career? Did your program influence your career? Um, did you need additional schooling, which sounds like you're in school now? And was this always your goal? Yeah, so the short answer is no, I didn't. Um, poli sci, I studied poli sci. I was in university when I, I studied because I found it most interesting, that in business. Um, so it didn't lead me to my career now. I work, I work, um, in private sector. So I work for a, a large manufacturing company called ABB, uh, probably like the third largest manufacturing company in the world. Um, and I work for a division of the company that's from North America. We have like nine plants in Canada, about 13 down in the States. And I run a sales region in Southwest Ontario that consists of 69 wholesaler locations and all the end users there. So I manage a stocking profile for 70-ish, about 70 branches and all the sales staff for those branches. And how I got into that, I kind of just fell into it on coming out of coming out of school. Um, coming out of King's University, graduated, and I always wanted to pursue a career of professional sports. So I got to do that. I was fortunate enough to have the opportunity to do that for, for a brief time. And, Coming out of that, um, I got a job working um, in like the for for what now or like one of one of our customers for their head office, and I recognized pretty early on that there was going to be a lot of opportunities. Given you know what I have, you know if you if you work hard, if you want to learn something, you're going to learn. Um, that goes for just about anything. So you know I I kind of worked diligently at this for a while and I kind of moved up to that company and then moving to the company I work for now, but I would say overall, you know, my beginning experiences at King's University working inside group work and discussion groups, your degree, you know, I work in business now and the room I share with, there's hard skills, there's engineers, there's finance, there's legal and poli sci needs to be able, you need to be able to keep all those people on the same page. And there's, there's certainly merit to some of the skills you're gonna to begin to acquire in these classrooms. And there's an argument certainly there for being that that soft skill being you know potentially one of one of the strongest skill sets that you will need in the future. And I would say if I was to be able to credit the degree that poli size, what I would define as a degree in critical thinking, and there's a huge space in the world of business for being able to have the capacity to do that and articulate it and get everybody on the same page moving towards something. And certainly what I learned in sports is that, you know, if you do have everybody on the same page with direction and like a proper vision, you can accomplish a lot very quickly. Um, so that's kind of what I think some of the skill sets that I would, I have developed began in the classrooms at Kings. Um, I certainly didn't, I didn't choose a career in, in politics or, or council or anything like that, but um, all of those things that you still will find in those rooms, you're going to find in the room of business. Um, you know, there's crucial conversations that happen on a daily basis. So 
I would say some of the the beginnings of that I would say happened in some of those classrooms at Kings and, and now I still work and refine on those skills uh, on a daily weekly basis in my in my professional career. So. Great. Thank you for sharing that. Monica, we'll go to you if you can talk about what you do now and and how Kings and Poli Sci led you to where you are. Yeah, absolutely. Well, ever since I was younger and, and really when I started at Kings, I knew I always wanted to be a lawyer. It's what I always sort of envisioned myself doing. And, and I was able to do that after a long road of education, as was sort of mentioned in, in the bio. After Kings, I, I built on it and I, I built on that political foundation. I, I did an MA in political science. I did a master's of public policy, and then I went to law school. So I knew throughout my journey what I was interested in, and, and I never lost that love of, of politics that I, I truly believe was instilled during my time at King's. And, and I wanted to be able to apply that to that tangible skill that I received, which being my law degree. And so I merged them by becoming a municipal lawyer. So I, I practice, which is not a very common, I will point this out, not a very common area of law. Every time people are like, oh, you're a lawyer. Can I get advice? And I'm like, yeah, I practice municipal. The questions just sort of stop right there. But, it, <laughs> but it, it, it's such an interesting area of, of law. And, and I practiced on, on both the private sector and in the public sector. And then I pivoted. And I'm now the director of municipal law and licensing at the city of Hamilton. And I found a position that really blends my passion for municipal politics, policy, and the law. And quite frankly, when I was in undergrad, even law school, I didn't know what I was doing right now was even a position. So I, I did see a question come up in the chat and I, I'm jumping the gun, I'm sorry. But if you don't know what it is you want to be doing right now, that is completely fine, as long as you're sort of continuing in on that journey. So what, what, what do I do? I, I, I'm the director. I oversee regulatory compliance and policy and bylaws at the city. We do administrative tribunals. We see it, we oversee enforcement. But what does that actually mean? So on, on a tangible level, I oversee a team during COVID that has been enforcing all of the provincial regulatory requirements that have been coming down. So when you're in different colors of red, yellow, and green, you're in step one, stage two, stage three, it's my team that's out in the community that's enforcing these things for public health and safety reasons. We oversee encampment sites, which is a growing concern in municipalities. We work with cities like San Francisco and Los Angeles and Houston, and, and we develop policy for, for housing strategies. And each one looks a little bit different, but we all collaborate together and, and we're trying to find workable solutions on the ground. We deal with recreational cannabis. The province legalized it and they've given out licenses and they said municipalities go wild, try to figure out how to regulate it. So another thing that we're working with. And we regulate things like the shared economy. So when you're getting into an Uber or a Lyft or you're staying at an Airbnb, and you wanna know how it's safe to operate or to go into those places, it's the cities that regulate them. So we put bylaws in place, we permit these companies to operate, we put regulatory requirements in place, meaning rules that they have to be followed, we, establishing the, we establish the licensing fee for these things to operate. So if you look like if you hop into an Uber in London versus Hamilton versus Toronto, all the prices are different because they're set by your municipality. And I, I find, and I found this throughout my career, that municipal government is often the level of government that gets overlooked when people are considering career choices. We always look at the province and we look at the federal government. And, and I'm not even sure if, if Dr. Hanna, if there's a municipal governance course offered at King's. And it's the area of, of government that impacts you the most. As students, you would see this in, in rental housing. If you see your rent going up, it's because there's a municipal bylaw in place that causes that. Your Uber fees you paid, like I mentioned earlier, or if you're partying at homecoming, we have a party nuisance bylaw, or you do at the City of London, which may regulate the way you can party or the place that you can party. And, and so if, if I could give any advice to anyone on this phone, it's to look and give a second look at, look, at working at a, at a municipal level. 
I, I think that there are so many opportunities for graduates, whether you're looking for a position just out of, out of your undergrad, or if you want to continue with your education and, and then look at it. It's, it's an area that has a lasting impact within your community. It's immensely rewarding and it, it's, it's always changing. It's always changing. Um, lastly, I will point out, I, I think it's clear from everyone on the call here today that there are so many different career paths that you're gonna be able to, to use from, from your political science degree uh, here, at, here at King's and so many opportunities. And if I could give any advice, it's make sure you take advantage of them. Thank you. All right, thanks, Monica. Colin, on to you. Tell us about what you're doing now and how you were influenced by Kings. Perfect, great, thank you. Uh, yeah, so a couple things, critical thinking, absolutely, Sean, you know, shared that, Monica as well. You know, there's so many different career paths uh, that will open up um, from a degree in political science. Uh, for me, I, when I when I was when I was in fourth year, I was convinced I was going to graduate and go work at uh, in go, go work in Ottawa, and I was going to work for some lobbyist, and I was gonna I was, I was looking at actually Canadian Federation of Independent Business, um, as uh, as one of one of my uh, potential employers, but some somewhere along the line, something changed uh, for me, and I'm not a hundred percent sure to this day what it was. Um, I, well, I think I think I think it was the uh, the offer of free beer. Um, but shortly after I graduated from Western, um, I got offered a position with Labatt Brewery in London, and that completely changed my uh, my career trajectory. And I was an operations manager there for for, for five years, and and it was uh, free beer. So uh, I couldn't turn that down that offer. There was a lot of other benefits too there, um, but I was I was in the business of uh, managing people. Uh, in a union environment, so I was I was in, I was in, in management, so I was non-union, and I was managing a union environment. And a man, I am so glad I took uh, my collaborative conflict resolution diploma after I graduated from Western. Um, you know, advice you're going to get lots of advice tonight. Some of the advice I'm going to impart on you right now is don't stop learning. You're never going to stop learning. Uh, you know, after you get your degree, if you decide to do go on do a postgraduate, do a master's, um, PhD, whatever it is keep on learning, never stop learning. Uh, because when you do get into a career, you will continue to learn, you'll never stop learning. Uh, and for me, right after I graduated from uh, King's, I did do my collaborative conflict resolution uh, diploma. And uh, I've made a focus in non neutral mediation, which non neutral mediation means you're representing the employer, but you're mediating between the employer and the employee. So that came in handy. Uh, when I was working at Labatt, uh, and, and managing people in a union environment. And I, and I had to mediate regularly uh, between uh, management um, who I was on their payroll. I was, they write my paychecks. Uh, so I had to be very careful, but I had to mediate with uh, in, in the, in the collaborative conf or sort of the, the um, uh, CBA. So it was, it was an interesting uh, experience, but a lot of the skills I learned, a lot of the soft skills uh, I learned at King's applied uh, applied to to that role. Um, I did that for five years. While I was there, that was my first real career. So um, I had a pension and all that fun stuff. And that's when I started to take an interest in personal finance, something I never really learned in school, as I think most of us can probably uh, relate to. Financial literacy is, is lacking in, in our in our education system. Uh, it's getting better, but it's still still not even remotely close to where it needs to be. So there's my plug for that. But anyway, uh, so I decided, you know what? I like investing. I like saving. I like, I like budgeting. I was weird like that. All of a sudden I started creating my own Excel spreadsheets and I became this nerd that I had no idea I even was. And I loved it. And so I decided I'm going to get into that field. So I started looking at some options and that's when uh, I uh, fell upon Sun Life Financial. And there's lots of great firms to work for uh, in, in the financial industry. And this is just one that, uh, you know, I really liked. I liked their culture and uh, I was an advisor for a couple of years. And then I've got into management again, I seem to always get attracted back into management and, and, and working with people. And uh, that's what I'm doing now. So my, my role now is business development partner. Uh, so really what that means, it sounds kind of fancy, maybe, I don't know, uh, but it's not. Uh, I just, I, I do work with advisors. So I, I hire advisors, I train, coach them, develop them uh, to become successful advisors. And eventually uh, they'll get their designations and become financial planners. Uh, and run their own practices. So that's that's what I'm doing. That's what I've been doing for the last uh, seven years now. 
And um, yeah, if I if I can uh, again, if I can part some wisdom on you uh, or uh, some advice, uh, definitely once you graduate, look at taking some more courses, continuing education courses. If you're not planning on doing a master's, a PhD, uh, find something you're passionate about, and uh, it's going to pay dividends. Uh, when you do get into uh, a, a career that you really like, um, it's going to show your employer that you're you're very keen on continuing your your learning, and it's going to show that uh, you have you've taken that initiative. All right. Thank you, Colin. Patrick, tell us about what you're doing now, and what influenced you. Sure thing. Um, these are just really cool stories. Just I think the one thing that I wish I knew starting university in the middle of university at the end of university is that career paths are unlinear no one just climbs towards what they always thought they were doing smaller jobs of what they were doing i think we all bop around like pinballs in a machine and if someone said that to me earlier i would have been more at ease entering a job market unsure of what i really wanted to do um like I said in the or it said in the bio, really I threw myself into student government. I loved helping people, and I think early on it's important for you to figure out what it is that you just can devote hour after hour into and never feel exhausted by because you enjoy it so much. You know, some people are really analytical. Some people are really good at cooking, and they can stay up all night and make Christmas cookies and never feel like a back pain. For, for me, I've always enjoyed navigation. I think, you know, I was an air cadet growing up as a kid and there's a little bit of military to that that I enjoyed wayfinding, but I enjoy helping people find their ways. And at King's, I was given that opportunity either as a student senator working through the academic side or as a president of the King's Council or of the vice president for the USC. In each of those roles, I was exposed to what I make the joke about little kid, big kid. I was exposed at a, um, at a time when you're on King's campus, you are on both a very generous trampoline that the harder you jump on it, the higher you will go. But you're also supported by like the biggest safety net that you can be entrepreneurial when you're at campus, you can run for things and then it doesn't matter if you lose, you can start a band, you can join clubs, and it all gets kind of erased unless you want to carry it forward when you're done on campus and you move on. And I think because I jumped deep into that trampoline, it got me into rooms and meetings and settings that exposed me to the big kid government. And so it was because I got involved in student government, it was because I raised my hand and ran in elections or volunteered on campaigns that I saw a glimpse of what it looks like outside. And like partially, yes, like I watched the West Wing and like later people will have watched like House of Cards and that's like definitely, you know, the scarier version of, of political staffing. But it was that idea that I loved helping people and navigating and I loved running around. I think I have way too much energy and I wear down dress shoes way too quickly. So I needed to find something that aligned with like what I like to do, plus with like this awful habit of buying shoes. And I saw, you know, the opportunity to work in politics. Um, I used to think that meant that you worked at a constituency office. So where the MP or the MPP or your city councilor might have like, you know, daytime hours. But for um, those who jump hard onto that trampoline, you get a glimpse of what it's like to be the attache, a press secretary, the person who follows around a minister, who holds a recorder, who writes the notes that are said during question period. And I was really fortunate after I graduated to have that opportunity to, to move to Toronto, to work for four and a half years at Queen's Park, um, to know the front page of the Toronto Star before it's published to really be able to be that source in the news that they can't identify because the, the talks are too high stakes. Um, I thrived on that energy and it allowed me to do those things such as helping people and navigate, uh, as well as really just run around and, and see things that you don't normally get to see. In 2015, um, when, when Monica was perhaps thinking about running, um, I was running uh, uh, behind the prime minister as he jet setted across Canada um, in his first campaign, um, you know, that exposure, that electricity that Kings gave me 
because I jumped on that trampoline, I ran, you know, allowed me to see a glimpse of big kid. But let me tell you, it's a burnout world in politics. All the glamour and glitz of being a politician is worn by the politician. All of the sweat and worn out shoes is worn by the staffers. I tell everyone who's given the opportunity to be a staffer or to work in Ottawa or work at Queen's Park or even work in the municipal government to do it. I think it's so important that you're exposed to that. But I also think, I throw around a lot of analogies, but like politics is like a highway and you need to know your off ramps. And for me, my off ramp was the opportunity to work with a few people that I met in politics to help people who know nothing about politics navigate government. And that group that I was attracted to, I also had to make sure that I could wake up and really early and stay up really late, feel passionate about helping these people navigate because I care about what they're doing. Um, so today I, I work at um, the Council of Canadian Innovators. We are an upstart business council. Um, we're about six years old and we represent solely Canadian based high growth technology companies. So these are the companies that are yearning to be the next Shopify. Um, in 2015, when it was just getting started, it was just 16 CEOs. It was kind of a dinner in Toronto that a group of CEOs got together and they were looking at the election that was taking place. And they were saying, how come no one's really talking about how to grow great Canadian companies? And everyone was talking about how do you bring Apples and Googles and Amazons to Canada. And so these CEOs called up two people. One of them happened to create the BlackBerry many years ago who had been retired at this point. And the two of them said, okay, we'll spearhead this, but we'll need a staff. And they hired some people that I worked with. And then I joined the team shortly after, and I've been there ever since. Um, on a day-to-day, -day, it's very different, which I also knew that I wanted. I wanted to feel that every day when I sh showed up to work or logged onto Zoom, that it was going to be a different agenda. Um, so I knew all of these things about myself, that I wanted to help people navigate, that I wanted high pace, that I wanted to run around. But I also learned that it's so important that you have these off ramps. And that's why these career paths are not linear. You know, where we get off and where we get on to that career path, oftentimes things just pop up, just like when you're driving down the 401 to London. And you need to know and listen to that knock, knock, knock in your stomach. And that's how you get to kind of make these decisions as you go. Because when I was sitting in, in Dr. Handa's class or when I was sitting um, at the table of my grad ball, you know, I didn't exactly know in two years out what I was going to be, but I was confident enough to say, I'll probably continue to follow this gut and, and be attracted to things that um, keep me energetic and energized and that electricity is very important to me. Um, so yeah, I help tech companies navigate the, the federal and provincial governments. I work solely um, with Canadian companies, which provides a very unique lens into conversations such as national security and economic policy, sovereignty discussions. Um, during the USMCA negotiations, I was in Montreal for discussions around data flows and how important it is for us to start looking at IP and zeros and ones, uh, the same way that we look at cattle and cows and cars and kind of the, the building blocks of the last economy. Uh, today, I work very closely with a group of cybersecurity CEOs, and I'm fortunate to, you know, get a glimpse into what the, the, the virtual trenches are that are so important to um, understanding where we're going to go um, uh, in a digital, globalized, uh, innovation-driven economy. So it's a, it's a lot of fun, and I, I do get to work with people that I, I care deeply about and I'm friends with. So that's another thing. When you, when you can attract good people around you and then have the opportunities to work with them, I think it's super important that you seize those. Right, thank you, Patrick. And thanks to all of you. Now we're actually sitting at 7.15 and we had a couple of more questions we'd asked our panelists to prepare, but I wonder if we might take some questions. And then after that, I'd like to ask our panelists to give one more piece of advice um, that you might want to share. Um, so how does that sound with everyone? Good. Sam, I'm seeing head nods from the panelists. So we'll, we'll carry on. So let me grab the questions. Um, this is from someone anonymous. Uh, great stories. I have two questions. First, were you folks stressed out about what your future held career-wise, especially in the second to third year mark? And second, if there was a piece of advice that you would give to second year you, what would it be? And I'll let, I'll just let you guys 
jump in, whoever wants to answer. Does the Explore I'll, I'll, program I'll, I'll, still exist? Oh, I'll sorry. Go ahead, Patrick. Does the, does, does the Explore program still exist? The Trois Pistoles, Trois Riviere, that ability to go and learn French. That's my biggest regret. I think um, if I could go back in time, I would do that. I think that program, the ability to immerse yourself in a different language, in a different land, um, I think I, I, um, I was two heads down to see the merits of that. And I think anyone that I know who has done that program, which I believe is free, because I believe that there's a, a generous subsidy to go and live for six weeks in Quebec. And I think it also takes you out to the Maritimes if you wanted to. That's something that I, I, I do wish I, I knew. Um, uh, uh, so I would recommend, and I think it was that second year or third year that a lot of my friends were doing it. And so if you aren't familiar with the program, I think it's called the Explore program. And the two main places that I think a lot of Western students go is Trois Rivières and Trois Pistol. Uh, you can't speak a word of English or else they'll kick you out of the program, but you will come away just like when, uh, Bart Simpson was in, in Paris, you, you walk away being able to somehow fluently speak French. Uh, I'll make a comment as well with regards to that anonymous question. So, I mean, yeah, in your second and third year, I think like you're kind of looking at a, a benchmark coming up, like as you're supposed to have it all sorted out so that you can just graduate and just right off in the sunset. I hate to tell you that's not gonna be the case. Uh, unfortunately, uh, careers, as, as Patrick mentioned earlier, they're very nonlinear. Um, I'm reading a book right now about Robert Iger. He's a 15 year CEO of Disney, extremely successful. One of the greatest, one of the greatest CEOs, uh, of, of the current, you know, last 30 years. And, uh, he bounced around everywhere. And that's, that's, that's an individual who did everything right. So my overall arcing advice, you know, it, it should be like micro ambitious, you know, whatever you are doing at that point in time, do it to the best of your abilities and learn as much as you possibly can about as much as you possibly can while you're engaged in it. Uh, and just be process driven, you know, like you, you're, there's going to be a lot of things you're not going to be able to control uh, in your professional career and your personal lives. These things are just going to happen and you're just going to have to learn how to like let go of some of those things. So overall, just, you know, you, you're going to have to make a, like a million decisions between now and wherever you wind up in your career. And the best thing you can do is make the best decision you can at that point in time with all the information you have at that point in time. Um, and it, it, as far as, you know, the, the job, whatever you're doing, I would say be extremely micro ambitious with it. Um, and, and on that point as well, like when you get into the workforce, uh, you're going to find like right now, up until if you're in your second or third year on this call, you, you're, you kind of, the, peers you surround yourself with you have you have a lot more in common with each other than you you realize so you've you've always been kind of governed by a curriculum where you show up and you do exactly this you'll do very well like in your profession in the business world if my manager comes to me at the end of the year and goes hey we did a soft launch of a product I think we have acquired 20% market share you want to go want to go firm those numbers up and I go back to that manager and I say yeah 20% you nailed it that's not a good job although I did exactly what he asked me to do, that's not sufficient. And, and I have to work with people from all walks of life right now. They all have different relationships with what work and what a career is to them. So my other advice would be this to be, to you know take advantage of the fact that everybody in the room for the most part is all looking to learn something right now. They're all looking for an experience. They're all looking to do something positive with their lives. When you go into your profession, wherever their pitch, profession may be, whether it be in poli sci, business, whatever the case may be, you're going to run into people from different generations, all with the different, you know, expectations of what work is to them. So um, learn as much as you can right now is when you're surrounded by peers that are looking to learn as much as they can right now. That's my advice. Monica, did you want to go ahead? I was wondering the same thing, Colin, because I saw you were off mute. You can go. I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up. Okay, I'll be, I'll be quick here. Um, you know, some great, great advice there so far uh, from Patrick and Sean. Absolutely. Um, you know, I when I was in second year, uh, I wasn't sweating what I was going to do so much after after I graduated. Um, I was 
too busy living in the moment, enjoying, uh, enjoying uh, the extracurriculars at, uh, at Kings and um, <clears throat> having some beverages with professors. Uh, but, uh, you know, I always figured when I graduated that, uh, that I, I, like I said before, that I was going to go to um, Ottawa. Uh, I really like the energy in Ottawa. I love that electricity. And you, maybe you will, and, and I, more power to you. Uh, but I, I never, I, I was never really concerned about it. And, and, and when I graduated, I, I, I kind of went in a few different places and before I ended up at Labatt really, but I ended up at Labatt pretty quickly. Um, I have a regret though. Uh, you know, the regret was, my regret is that I should have traveled a little bit more uh, after I graduated. Um, life is going to go by quickly. And you're going to realize that as, 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 as you progress in your career, uh, if you decide to, you know, have a family, what children, for whatever reason, they really make you or make time go by fast. Uh, I have discovered. Um, but it, it, take the time now when you're in school, and when you graduate, take the time for yourself. Don't worry about a career. Uh, the careers are going to be there and most people are going to, and this is just maybe my advice, but you know, careers are going to come. You're going to probably have multiple careers, uh, in your lifetime. Uh, and you're going to learn so many different things from different careers. Uh, you're going to learn, have so many different experiences. Make sure you're taking time for yourself. Uh, I should have traveled and, 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 and volunteered a little bit more abroad. Uh, there was a couple of charities uh, that I was seriously looking at and uh, ended up not pulling the trigger on. And I wish I did. I think that would have, um, you know, really helped me in my development. But uh, uh, definitely take some time um, after you graduate and, and, and uh, you know, volunteer, give back. Uh, do some traveling, do some personal development, do things for yourself. Don't worry about the careers. Uh, have a little bit of humility, um, you know, because when we graduate, we think that we're ready for maybe a certain type of career. And, and then we find out that uh, we have to start somewhere else and build our way up. And that's totally fine. Uh, we all have to do that. We have to work our way up to, you know, where we want to get to. And, and it's going to take time. So if you're graduating, you're like, okay, I want to get into this career. How do I get into that career? Well, you, it may not be a direct line. You may have to take very, very, like several different steps to get to uh, that career you want to get. And that's totally cool. Hi. So, so if I'm looking at the question, were you, were you stressed out in second and third year career wise? I will be honest. I absolutely was. I, I was constantly thinking, oh my goodness, what, what's the next degree I have to get? Or what does that job look like? What does articling look like? And in hindsight, I think I put a little bit too much pressure on myself. I think what Colin has said is, is so important and I wish it's something I would have maybe taken to heart when I, when I was in, in undergrad, that you do need to make sure you do have that, that balance because your, your, your career path is not gonna be linear. You're hearing that from everyone on, on the call today. We think we're going here and then it throws a curveball and you end up that way. And you learn early on when you leave school that there's no curriculum for a career. It's really you figuring it out. And, and when you have that network, it, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to bounce ideas off and, and you get opportunities to be able to, to build on. And all of these different skills you'll learn by taking a left turn and a right turn are gonna be tools in your tool belt so that when this opportunity presents itself, you're gonna be equipped to, 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 to succeed. Um, I, I think I, I mentioned um, that it, it's important to take those opportunities that come to you and you might not think of them at the time and you might think, oh my goodness, why am I doing this? It's, it takes up too much. I'll, I'll give an example. I, when, when I was articling and I, I, I was interested in municipal law, there weren't a lot of opportunities for um, Canadian opportunities for, for sort of reading on municipal law. It sounds so simple, but there was no subscription. So there was this, this organization based out of Washington, DC. And so I, I just cold called them. I called them, I said, hi, I'm an articling student. I'm really interested in municipal law. You guys run this international uh, lawyers association dealing with municipal lawyers. And, and I'd love to just get a subscription to your magazine, but I'm a student. Do you think you could waive it for the first year? And, and they did. And, and, and they did, and, and what that relationship built is after 10 years, I now write for them on a, on a monthly basis. So the very journal that I wanted a subscription to is now one that I contribute to on a monthly basis. And, and I think it kind of ties into question number two, perhaps from Ryan, when it's about putting yourself out there. I, I think it's so important to put yourself out there, whether it be, and maybe I'm dating myself, but whether it be a cold LinkedIn message, 
or a, a, a reaching out to any of the alumni from Kings. I think that you're going to get so much value from putting yourself out there and asking for help. It is, it, it is not a bad thing to ask for help at any level of your education or any level of your career. And, and I would strongly encourage you to do it. And, and I, the, if you don't ask, the answer is always going to be no. But if you put yourself out there, you're going to get that opportunity. So I encourage you, if I can, if this is my last second to say something on the call, I would encourage you to connect with each one of the alumni that are, that are here speaking tonight. Each one will add value to you, value input, advice to your journey. And it'll, they'll all be uh, tools in your tool belt that you'll be able to utilize and, and a network that you'll be able to count on. So thank you. Thank you, Monica. And we do have a couple more questions, including Brian's, which I'll, I'll read. But um, I did want to just put a plug in that if you put on LinkedIn that you're a King's grad, you can you can do both Western and King's. You just it looks like you went to two different universities at the same time. But make sure you put King's University College as your university, because then LinkedIn loves to who do you know? You know, you may know this person and um, you'll start seeing all those connections from Kings pop up on LinkedIn. It is a great way to reach out to people um, probably that are going to be matching in your career um, just because of your interests that are on LinkedIn later, um, but also the fact that it's Kings and we are getting very, very close on time. So um, Ryan's question was, and I think it's been somewhat addressed, but what are the tips for students who discovered their passion for political science in their undergrad who may not have that politics background for high school? And additionally, what worked best for you in terms of networking in the field of politics? In other words, putting your name out there. I, I, I can take this one. Um, just the point, and Monica started it, like all of you should have connected by now with LinkedIn. Um, I get a lot of Western people reaching out, but as soon as it's Kings, it feels different. Mm -hmm. it, it's like, you know that they're, like you've taken the extra step, right? You're not just putting the Western and you're just done. You're like, no, I want to make sure that people know that I'm a Kings grad. When I was at Queens Park, Tom Tian was the premier's chief of staff. Tom, Kings grad. You know, Western grads are abundant. If you have a Sonos speaker today, Sonos is run by Patrick Spence, you know, a Western grad from the 80s, but you don't really have much of a connection beyond saying, listen, I'm one of the 250,000 graduates of Western, but there's a lot fewer Kings grads. And you probably know people when you're able to pull those together. So make sure your LinkedIn is updated to say Kings. It's more likely that a grad, like an alumni will actually say, oh, interesting. Like, I wonder, you know, what do we have in common? And probably a lot. Um, it, you don't need to be um, interested in, in politics in high school. I think I was more interested in power in high school. So I think, you know, you just, you're driven to those things. Um, I think what's super important uh, is volunteering. I think networking is important when you are networking for a job that you are obviously um, in service to yourself to an extent. You know, you're trying to build this network of people that might be able to open doors for you in a certain business or an employer or, you know, just a sector. Um, I think a lot of the great experience that I've gained is through service to others. And I recommend volunteering as a great way to meet people who come from a variety of different sectors and backgrounds, who know a variety of different people in those sectors, who would be thinking about you because they know that you have a heart and a soul and a spirit that wants to give back to a community, a cause or something that is outside of yourself. Um, I think about just in the board um, uh, roles that I have, you know, the opportunity to be able to come together and meet people from all different walks of life and all different backgrounds, you know, united in the fact that we care about a certain cause, that opens up a network. It's also very different than when you show up to a networking event and say, I'm here to network and I'm here to walk away with five business cards and I'm going to follow up on LinkedIn with them. That's very important. But I think the, the, the more casual form of networking is building a network of people that share the same values, the same ethics, the same belief in, in structures and in, 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 in interests that you have. And I think when people can think about you as someone who's interested, they might work in a totally different sector. They might work in politics too, 
um, and they'll be able to pull you forward. Um, but uh, on campus, if you're interested in politics, we have some great political clubs. Um, you can also take out, you can try each year to be part of a different party and see how that goes, because you might not know which party you, you know, associate and affiliate with. I think um, uh, by the third time, you should figure it out because they probably won't let you in. They'll think you're a mole, but um, it's, uh, it's a great, you know, that trampoline metaphor is true. You can try a lot. Um, you can be invited to model parliament, you can be invited to party caucuses and to, to party conferences. Um, you can, the other thing that I was really involved with is called the Ontario Undergraduate Student Alliance. Um, that is a lobbyist organization for undergrads. So you go to Queen's Park and you lobby on academic policy, such as um, post-secondary policy, such as financial aid and OSAP. You know, so you get a taste of politics, but from a different angle. So I think utilize all the clubs, all the different volunteer opportunities on campus, but really try to figure out what else can you be doing in service to others that really helps you build out a network of people that think about you in a different light than just trying to get a job. Because I think those people will come around at different points of your life and really be helpful. Oh, I think you're on mute, Jana. Sorry, we, we knew that had to happen at least once. I clicked it, but I didn't really click it. Didn't catch. Um, just really quickly, and Monica, we may want to connect you um, with, I believe it was Robert, had a question, but did law school help you, sorry, did political science help you in your studies in law school? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I think what I gained from Kings and has kind of been echoed by everyone here is, is the soft skills as well as the hard skills. You're going to learn those analytical skills. You're going to get public speaking, which is so important because the Socrates method is, is true in law school when they will just point to you and you stand up and you recite everything and you do both arguments and, and all of it. So being able to think on your feet, public speaking, um, and, and being a free thinker, being able to craft an argument, even though you disagree. I think that that's so important. And I alluded to that earlier with uh, with one of the seminars that I took with Dr. McCur or Dr. William McCurcher. So absolutely, did I see you're off mute? I'm wrapping it up, but it, it absolutely did. And, and make sure, again, you are, time management is also a very important skill that you <laughs> learn at King's that you will also learn uh, and utilize in law school. And I am applying it right now. Thank you, Jana. <laughs> Good. Well, we are out of time. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists, Patrick, Sean, Monica, and Colin, for making time to be here tonight. Um, if anyone does want to connect with our alumni, you can, you can contact us and we'll connect you um, in our office. Um, before we um, end, I also want to thank someone who has very quietly and patiently sat among our panelists this evening, and that's Laura Peters. She's new to King's. She's actually um, a, a liberal arts grad, but from Queens University and um, has been working in nonprofit the last several years, but also formerly worked um, in Queens and alumni and at St. Clair College. But she is new to Queens as alumni engagement officer. So you will be seeing her more and more. And um, she normally will be hosting these evenings or the, these um, sessions, but um, welcome Laura. So, and, and I also wanna thank again, our professors, Dr. John Grant and Dr. Aaron Hanna very much. And although you probably can't see him, but Mr. Corey Cook, who's our ITS guru here at Kings. Is there anything anyone else needs to add our professors? And political science uh, grad too. No, oh, good. <laughs> we could have, you could have answered some of the questions, Corey. Could have. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I think that brings us to the end of our evening. I am sincerely grateful to all of you. Have a great evening, and I look forward to continuing these conversations another time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.